examining how EC Comics artists influence the artists of today. So last, you know, this is the second part of a two-part look at EC Comics. Um, last episode, we kind of gave a background on EC Comics, their history. Um, you know, it's still celebrated. Those artists are have been reprinted essentially ever since they were originally printed. They've been reprinted, repackaged, and continue to be reprinted to this day by Fanographics now. Oh, listen, man. We live in an era where two companies are doing reprints. Fantagraphics are doing these like artist-driven specific reprints so you could buy like a book full of Graham Ingalls comics or or Frazetta or Al Williamson. I don't know about the Frazetta. He didn't do that much. But you get what I'm saying. And then uh, Dark Horse is doing like archive editions where they'll just, you know, collect six or seven issues of all the series. Well, we can go to a third publisher and talk about IDW doing several artist editions that either highlight artists like Wally Wood or highlight EC as a whole. I think they've done two volumes of EC comics, which are amazing because they include Bernie Krigstein, uh, another artist who didn't produce that much work, but man, the stuff he did was beautiful. So yeah, it's, uh, it's, you know, widely considered a high point in comics history. Uh, I think that can, people debate on that. Sometimes it's overrated or underrated, but certainly they're still around and still a huge influence, I think, on comics. Yeah, yeah. The, the debaters are just contrarians. And, and if there's anything to debate, um, it probably would be the fact that those comics don't work as comics. It's like it's like illustrated picto fiction or something, which th those comics do become at a at a later date whenever the comics code comes in effect and everything turns to magazine format. But based on pure craft, step to Wallywood, man. Like like if you're a shit talker, man, you better not be drawn with a you know, you know a, a, a crayon. <laughs> <laughs> so the first. Uh... I was about to call out names, like a specific guys. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> so that's what I that's spoke the best too I come soon. Up with. <laughs> no, no, no. Like I, I said, the crayon thing because I was about to say I was about to start calling calling dudes out. I feel all red in the face. I'm glad the camera ain't oh, on me. Oh man, that, 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 the, the call outs would have been uh, spicy. Let me get more famous. That'd be an excerpt. <laughs> Let me be more financially secure, man, and we'll take the gloves off. So they trace the influence of EC, and their first big stop is with Warren Publications. So Warren, I believe, started in the 70s, maybe the late 60s. No, it was definitely around in the 60s. Okay. So Warren starts in the 60s, and it's magazine format comics, which allows them to get around the comics code. Uh, working in black and white, a lot of the artists who did work at EC Comics went on to do work for Warren and their um, horror titles would have been Creepy and Eerie and Vampirilla. Got a couple of those, man. Like, uh, the earliest Creepies and Eeries, you could go through them as you wish, man. Uh, the earliest, look, for Zeta cover. cover. Yeah. Uh, the earliest Creepies and, weary, and Eeries are the ones ones that you want. Um, you you can see these artists. Reed uh, Crandall. Steve Ditko, Frazetta. Uh, Williamson, Greg. Wally Wood, like like they're all represented. Alex Toth, you even, know, like even Angelo Torres was there at the end of uh, EC's tenure, and this is a logical like like James Warren. Uh, I think they're making a documentary about him, or or it's on the horizon. I know Fanographics just put a book together about his life, and he is when you talk about fanboy or whatever, like like a Steve Geppi, like with the rings and stuff. Like th from every account I've heard, that's James Warren. You know, he was just an incessant fan of this stuff. Who knows how he got his money initially, but uh, however he got it, he, he, sp he spent his money on, on, his, on his passions. And, the e and these EC-inspired stories, it's a logical jump from what he was publishing before, which I believe he was the publisher for Famous Monsters magazine. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's... A very logical jump. I'm, I'm doubting myself about that now, so I, I, I may be wrong, but, but I, I think I'm right. Look, scratch board. That's incredible, man. Yeah. And uh, Blazing Combat, which would be like a like a Kurtzman inspired war book that I think only lasted this many issues, four issues, written by Archie Goodwin for the most part. You know, go on to uh, be a prominent uh, Marvel editor. Yeah, a lot of the credits in this, you know, a lot of the writing in this issue is uh, Archie Goodwin. And that'll be the same throughout throughout basically Vampirella and. And uh, 
all the rest. It starts to get really thin. Like it's it's almost not even worth like looking. That's why I didn't even pull any of this stuff out of the. Great covers though. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 showing some of your archival uh, <laughs> skills. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, and I saw the, the date on here. Well, this one is 1970. I think that first one I flipped through was 1966, so give you some idea of when these are coming from. But same deal, you know, a couple of horror hosts give you an O. Henry story. Yep. It's shock ending. Maybe a little bit more palatable for 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 the times of like the seventies, you know, not quite so on the nose as the EC stuff was, where you could pretty much predict how things were going to end by page two. Yeah, and they kind of go through and they list like the East, some of the EC artists that were uh, common to the Warren publications, but then also you know a new generation that was highly influenced by the EC comic artist guys like Bernie Wrightson, Richard Corbin, Gray Morrow, Gray Morrow. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. And I think I think it's a uh, in in one's career as a cartoonist. Well, I'll put it this way. Another th sort of vestige or homage to the old EC days that would happen quite often. Um, you could find a million examples of comics doing like sort of cribbing the aesthetic design choices of um, the the new trend titles. So you know, cut off the top third of the masthead for the title, have something pithy along the side, usually, followed by three boxes with, uh, you know, various hosts or, or features that will that will show up uh, within. Um, you know, Frank Miller's done it with his Lance Blastoff character. I forget what the heck that comic was called. Tells to offend? That's it, yeah. And uh, so, as a cartoonist, I, I think that it's a rule, a mandate that that one should do at least one EC homage cover in order to be considered a professional cartoonist. So we have a couple to show off here. Yeah, this is from uh, a zine collecting some of my artwork and commissions and cover work. This is from a show um, that uh, Mondo put on or Alamo Draft House. I'm not sure which, but one of the shows in, in Austin. Um, the Rapture. Yes, The Rapture, using the Weird Science uh, cover template and Great lettering. I, I always love those logos. Um, Shock Suspense Stories. So this was kind of their crime title. Um, showing uh, Breaking Bad. This was around the time of the end of Breaking Bad. And then uh, Weird Science homage to uh, Spider-Man's origin, right? Peter Parker being bit by a spider. So kind of Weird Science tie-in. Yeah, with your best like L. Feldstein kind of uh, impersonation, man. I dig it, man. <laughs> And what course, about you, Ed? I got one myself, man. <laughs> the box set for Hip Hop Family Tree. This isn't really a plug, but we're just, it's apropos. You could find this in a link below, I'm sure. <laughs> but you see what we're talking about. Just crib the uh, little horror host thing, masthead, you know, say something cool at the top. Everybody does them. There was yeah, probably. You could find a, a thousand of these things looking through comics history. And, and every important comic probably has one. Oh yeah you know what when I was a little kid I was already a mark for Tales from the Crypt comics and they in on the HBO show when they when they introduced the episode there um, there's a Mike Vosberg illustrated uh Tales from the Crypt comic so it's like you saw that so I'm a little kid I'm at the department store mom said I could get a Nintendo tape so this one jumped out at me <laughs> Wall Street Kid Cost cost twenty dollars of my little kid money, man, <laughs> and I was totally ripped off, man. It's like a point and click gimmick where you uh you have to like deal with your accountant and you have to <laughs> buy and trade stocks, and then you have you have this girlfriend that you have to take care of, and sh and see he's a punk, right? So like he'll get her, he won't get her like a mutt puppy, you know, like something from a shelter or a rescue dog. She just wants pedigree dogs, man. So you spend $1,000 on a dog to keep her happy. <laughs> Great lesson for kids. It's about work-life balance, Jim. <laughs> yeah, I remember. That, that's uh, one of the most popular Nintendo games of all time, right? It is kids, for being the worst. that up. <laughs> <laughs> it is one of the most popular for being the worst uh, Nintendo game next to uh, Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde. 
A couple of the other names that they mention, um, Harvey Kurtzman's influence. So getting away from the horror side of this, the EC Comics influence is the underground guys, Robert Crumb, um, Art Spiegelman, which then leads to the generation in the early 90s, which would be guys like Peter Bagg, Hernandez Brothers. Um, you know, they all cite Kurtzman as being an influence. And then the other piece that is mentioned is Al Williamson, who was super young whenever he was working for EC Comics. And I knew Al Williamson because he was inking and, and doing artwork at Marvel and DC at this point. Uh, things like the Blade Runner movie adaptation, Star Wars movie adaptations, um, and inking Daredevil over John Romita Jr. on a run that I'm very fond of. For sure. He would he would be at the uh, Pittsburgh Comic Con and, and was very spry and, and all over the place. And, and I remember thinking, like, could there be two Al Williamsons in comics? Because those comics came out in 1953 or something like that. You know what I mean? Now, he was he was at the tail end, but he's all over those sci-fi books. Those were like 54. And uh, you're right. He was like, I, not even like 19. He was like 16 or something like that and had impeccable talent. The, the legacy guy I would add, and I don't know if he came out after this article. It might have been like mid-90s, but Mark Schultz, Xenozoic Tales, um, Cadillacs and Dinosaurs, the, the more popular name for that. But you can see the EC influence on his work big time, um, even down to some of the line work, I think, is reminiscent of guys like Al Williamson and, and Wally Wood. He shocked, me when, when, he shocked me when we bumped into him, and I asked about his like lifelong fandom of EC Comics, and he's like, I discovered that stuff when I was like 25. <laughs> I'm like, wow, because because it's so in his DNA. You know, he really reverse engineered that stuff and internalized it in like a very way that's not like um, just like passe, like homage or something. It's like it's become his style. Yeah, I think if you're a fan of Wally Wood and Al Williamson's drawing, you would probably enjoy uh, Xenozoic Tales. 